and join us to talk more about football, the Eagles, the NFL, and more. He writes for 97.3 ESPN.com. Our Eagles insider also covers the NFL for today's pigskin. He is the one and only John McMullen. John, welcome to a Monday. Hey, and welcome to you, Josh. So speaking of football season, John, uh, you know, before we get to the game on Saturday, yesterday the Eagles were proactive. They got some of their cuts out of the way. And leading the cut list were Reuben Randall and Chris Givens. And I can't help but not say, John, man, Peter King, e- either the guy is a prognosticator or he just knew something that everybody else didn't. Well, I'm not so sure. It turned out to be correct, but I, I don't want to go too overboard because remember the situation. Doriel Green Beckham was not here uh, at the time when Peter King wrote that. So he might have had, I, I mean, nobody's plugged in more than Peter, uh, and he might have got it from Howie Roseman that they weren't all that thrilled with his work ethic or his laissez faire attitude, something of that nature. But at that particular time, to say he wasn't going to make the team and, and then claim it, it turned out to be correct, I, I'm, sure, I'm not sure that's a stretch because things have changed so much. And, and Doriel Green Beckham pretty much took his spot. So I, I'm not sure. In fact, I am sure if that trade isn't made, Randall's probably still here today. That's not a guarantee he would make the final 53. But uh, clearly that trade had a lot to do with him leaving this quickly. Yeah, you're looking at a guy in Randall. This is a guy who we knew had a lot of talent, John, but it seems like now we're in a situation where the Eagles are saying, you know what, we were, you know, maybe we don't need them because of Doyle Green Beckham. And does this now mean that Paul Turner is going to make the roster? Yeah, I mean, most likely. Uh, talked to Paul today at his locker, and he's, you know, He's the, he's the leader in the clubhouse, but he can't get comfortable because the Eagles are not happy with the talent level at that position as a whole. And remember, uh, as I keep saying, after they made the trade for Beckham, they also tried to pick up Rasheed Bailey on waivers, got beat to it by the San Diego Chargers. So that told you a couple things. It told you, A, they're not happy with what's on hand, and B, they're still looking to add more bodies. So if there are other cuts around this league, especially when you go from 75 to 53 and the Eagles like somebody better, there's still an opportunity they might bring someone else in from outside the organization. Either way, I think Paul's going to be here. At worst case scenario, it's going to be the practice squad. But the second part of that, Josh, I think people have to understand how rosters are built. And this is another reason why Reuben Randall's not here. Uh, if you're going to be the fifth receiver, uh, and that would have been, and that's essentially what Paul Turner projects to take from Ruben Randall or Chris Givens, you have to contribute on special teams. And those veteran guys, they're not used to doing it. They're not good at it. And that's another major reason uh, why the Eagles have gone in the direction they've gone. John, looking at the Eagles roster overall net right now between the cuts and between the guys that are on injured reserve, they're way ahead of the curve now before Tuesday. And it seemed like Doug Peterson said at his press conference, part of the reason why they cut Randall and Givens was to give those guys kind of like a courtesy to say, I know you guys are veterans. You have a chance to latch on somewhere else. So we're going to give you that head start. Yeah, and that's true. That, that That's what they did. It's still difficult at this time of year. Uh, because there, everyone knows there's going to be a ton of guys on the street come Saturday. So uh, it's not going to be easy for them either way. Uh, but that was part of it because clearly there are some other young receivers on this team. Caleb Jones still is here. David Watford, uh, you know, a college quarterback trying to transition to wide receiver. They're obviously uh, not as high on the pecking order as a Givens or, or a Randall. Uh, but they were kept, and those guys were cut, and that was part of the reason. They wanted to give the veterans some deference and, and give them at least a little bit more time uh, to try to catch on somewhere else. And I think, you know, Randall has enough in his history that he's going to play in this league somewhere. It's just a matter of where. Uh, and he's going to have to overcome 
uh, the perception about him because now it's two cities. It's not only New York with the Giants, but it's also in Philadelphia where people have questioned his, as I said, his work ethic, his attitude, however you want to describe it. He, he's going to have to overcome that. John, another piece of news that came out today, Doug Peterson talking about Carson Wentz. He says the one rib is healed, but the other rib is only 60% healed, and then it looks like he will not be playing Thursday night. But he was at practice today, so you know what is going on with that? Yeah, he's not going to play. I mean, he, he, he pretty much admitted that himself at his locker before practice. Doug left a little bit of a door open. Uh, by saying, as you mentioned, he, he went very scientific, and I didn't know they could <laughs> get percentages on the healing of various ribs, but he said the one is at 60%, and if it stays at 60% or it's not at 100%, he's not going to play, and that's pretty evident. He's not going to play on Thursday, and uh, it's certainly not going to make a game that really has nothing in it besides Carson Wentz potentially getting some snaps. Now you, you might see McLeod Bethel Thompson for the entire game. So Thursday night's game is not going to be very, very exciting. But it is important to some guys on the bubble and, and, and of that nature, but certainly a lot of star power is gone from it because Carson's not going to be out there. How much does this put Carson Wentz behind in learning the offense? I mean, obviously he can make mental reps, but you know, Doug Peterson seems to be a guy who's very big on guys actually getting, you know, practice and game reps. Yeah, he admitted it hurts. And remember, this was when he was supposed to get all his playing time because once the season starts, he's going to be the third string quarterback. And the just reality of an NFL season. You don't get many reps if you're a third-team guy in practice, and you're certainly not going to get them in games. So hey, we're not going to see a lot of Carson Wentz if everything goes to plan from this point forward. And if you look at what is happening around the NFC East, most notably in Dallas with Tony Romo, and the fact that the Eagles are playing very well and I think better than people expected, it's looking more and more likely that this team could contend in a bad division. And if they're contending, Sam Bradford's going to be on the field unless he's not healthy. We're talking with John McMahon or 97.3 ESPN.com Eagles Insider. Also covers the NFL for today's pigskin. You can follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. John, looking back to that game three you know, I, I kind of had a bit of a deja vu moment because I remember last year at this time, you know, Sam Bradford looked like, a you know, amazing. And then the start of the season, he wasn't so amazing. And and the Colts defense, I mean, let's be realistic, that's a pretty mediocre defense even when they're all healthy. So, you know, how much of a grain of salt should we stick on the Eagles offense from what we saw on Saturday? Uh pretty big grain of salt. Uh, I mean, let's face it, as you mentioned, you don't have to go back very far. Sam Bradford is the greatest week three preseason player in NFL history. He was <laughs> almost perfect in Green Bay, and how did that work out? So, uh, You mentioned Indianapolis didn't play a lot of guys. I, I think they had seven starters down. They didn't play. Uh, they're not very good defensively, even when they're at full strength. They're not game planning, it was evident. So all of that is sort of a perfect storm and why you don't take it that seriously. But from the Eagles' perspective, hey, you can only play who's in front of you. Uh, and they performed very well. And, and that's a positive development, a positive sign, because while the defense has hit the ground running, the offense has struggled. And they needed to get something going. I think you saw some of the positives of a Doug Peterson coach team versus a Chip Kelly one and, and that you saw him manufacturing touches for Josh Hub, getting Trey Burton involved, and, and that's some of those different formations you're going to see this year that take, takes advantage of individual skill sets uh, that you didn't have in what was more of a, a cookie-cutter approach that relied on tempo. So uh, I think there's a lot of positives to take from it, but the NFL – preseason is what it is and it's not very important winning and losing uh success it's proven uh as i mentioned with mike 
last week, you don't have to go back very far. The only 0-16 team in NFL history, the Rod Marinelli Lions, were 4-0 in the preseason. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, looking at another thing I did, the positives I took away, John, looking at the offense, was you got to see what Doug Peterson has been alluding to, which is we've been building plays for Josh Huff, and it looks like we actually got to see those plays, and he did pretty well with them. Yeah, he did. Uh, there's two ways you can look at that. That's, you know, one that Josh is probably the best player the Eagles have with the football, with the exception uh, of with the football in his hands, with the exception of Darren Sproles. So on one hand, that's not very good because you'd like to have somebody better than Josh Huff. Sure. But on the other hand, he does have some athletic ability. He does. He, he's a speedy guy, and he's good. Uh, when he's in space, he just has trouble getting all press coverage. Uh, he has trouble running routes. He's not a natural receiver. And, and what Doug has done is he's developed this entire package of plays. You saw the jet sweep. You're going to see bubble screens. Uh, you're going to see him in the backfield at times, sort of to get out uh, and get past press coverage. Uh, and you're going to see some quick pass patterns designed to get him the ball very quickly. Uh, and we'll see how it works out, but if you have somebody like Josh Huff who struggles at those other aspects, that's the way you got to go about it. And that's what I like about this coaching staff, as opposed to the one that was just here, is that they took a look, uh, they take a look at the players they have and build around those particular players. And I think that's the way to get long-term success in this league because players – win games more than coaches. You know, he kind of reminded me a little bit. I remember when in Kansas City, when Dexter McCluster first got to the NFL, they kind of used him the same way, John. Yeah, and DeAnthony Thomas, they've done it for a while. Uh, and, and that's what you have to do. I, I mean, there are guys like that all over the NFL because there's so many spread offenses now in college. Uh, a lot of guys aren't really good route runners. And, uh, they struggle, uh, especially when they get to the NFL and see big-time cornerbacks who can get really, really physical. Uh, so if you want to take advantage of their athleticism, uh, you got to find ways to do it. And it, to do it inventively uh, and move guys around like that and sort of play a Where's Waldo game, Andy Reid was famous for just moving Brian Westbrook all over the football field. And, that's part of it uh, because you have to get guys like that matched up in situations where they can take advantage of what they do well, and that's what he's trying to do with Josh Huff. Another guy on the offensive side that looked good at the receiver position was Doriel Green Beckham. He had that touchdown on a play that seemed like he's like the perfect guy for it. But also, John, what I liked is that he seemed to be much more comfortable than I expected for a guy who's only had so much time in a new offense. Yeah, and I think they would have had two touchdowns because uh, there was another sort of uh, fade pass that, that it was a really good throw from Sam Bradford. It looked like Doriel turned the wrong way. So they're not on the same page just yet, and that makes a lot of sense. He hasn't been here very long. Uh, he's he's going to be one of the uh, guys who does play on Thursday night because he needs more repetitions in this offense. But you kind of saw... Uh, the skill set, the talent, it, it's just worlds above anybody else on this team, and, and it's not close. Uh, and, and you mentioned the fade pattern for a touchdown. That's something uh, Philadelphia, have, Philadelphia fans haven't seen since Terrell Owens as far as just pure physicalness from a wide receiver. Uh, not to say he's going to be that type of player, but it's it's evident early on if if he keeps his nose clean if he works uh, if he turns into the um, the kind of citizen the Eagles want him to be he's going to be the best receiver on this team and it's going to happen pretty quickly. John, one guy who did not look good but is not according to Doug Peterson playing this Thursday is Nelson Aguilar, and it seems like. I don't understand Doug Peterson's reasoning. He's saying, oh, I don't want him to get injured. Well, a guy can get injured in practice. I mean, we saw that with Jordan Matthews. So, you know, I, John, what what is going on here? Why is Nelson Aguilar kind of getting the, the, the bypass here? 
Yeah, well, you're, you're like the rest of us because we all look at, at Doug with blank stares and ask, why? Why isn't this guy playing when Josh Huff is going to play and Doriel Green Beckham? Now, it's understandable, as I said, with DGB because he just got here and he needs the reps. But uh, he's treating Nelson Aguilar like he's an entrenched star. He's treating him like he's Jordan Matthews, if Jordan Matthews was healthy. And he's been anything but. And I, I've said it from the beginning of camp. He has not looked good. He's obviously not playing with confidence. Uh, maybe this is a way of sort of managing that the personality flaw in a different way. And, and Doug is trying to show him, look, I have confidence in you. Why don't you have confidence in yourself? I, I think everybody looks at his pedigree as a first-round pick, and they say, what, what is the problem here? Why is this guy not producing at all? Uh, and they keep waiting uh, for the faucet to kind of turn on. I, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure it's going to happen. And I, I, at some point, you would think he has to play better because it's really, really difficult to play any worse. Uh, and I, I guess that's that's what Doug's trying to do. And, and the fact that at some point uh, he, he can't be bad this bad uh, consistently in hopes at some point the light goes off. But uh, to not give this guy reps uh, on Thursday strikes me as a mistake. Uh, unless, as I said, he's going the Phil Jackson route and, and trying to massage things mentally and, and, and through personality because Nelson Aguilar is certainly not deserving uh, to be in the category of you name it, whether it's Fletcher Cox, Benny Logan, Connor Barwin, Sam Bradford, Jordan Matthews, Zach Ertz, all the guys who probably aren't going to play, he does not belong in that group. I, I John, I mean, do you, do you know a good sports shrink for Aguilar to see? Because I, I think it's, there's got to be something mental going on with the guy. You would think, and, and it's interesting, personality-wise, he, he seems, and I said it in the past, he seems much more engaging this year. He was very shy. Last year, uh, when the media would talk to him and gather around his lockers, he always put his eyes to the ground and sort of it looked a little painful for him. And now he's he, he's really grown. He, he he answers every question he talked today, even after the struggles. Uh, so from that aspect of it, he seems like he's grown a lot, but it hasn't translated to the football field. And, you know, I, I joked on at 973ESPN.com, Doug sort of took a page out of Chip Kelly's book and said, use the Riley Cooper defense and talked about his blocking today. And, <laughs> you know, come on. At some point, you're like shaking your head. This is a first round pick. Remember, this guy was a first round pick. Doriel Green Beckham was a second round pick. Now, there were reasons for that right. and, and the off the field issues DGB had. And, Everyone knew he had a better skill set, and, and we all understand that. But if you just see the two of them on the football field and, and you just said someone who, who, who came out of a coma, who's the first-round pick? Well, they're taking DGP. They're not taking Nelson Aguilar. John McMullen covers the Eagles for 97.3 ESPN.com. Also, the NFL for today's pigskin. You can follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. John, if we can get to the NFL for a couple things. Uh, first of all, the Joey Bosa saga is finally over. It seems like both sides compromised. Joey Bosa is getting a ton of money up front guaranteed, over $17 million guaranteed in the signing bonus up front, while the Chargers get their offset language compromise. In the end, John, was it was it just a compromise that was needed? Do you think there was something else going on? Well, yeah, I mean, the compromise was needed, but certainly something else was going on because this is all structured. This is not new. I, I've seen people on Twitter who who don't understand the NFL's contractual system and saying uh, Bosa won or the Chargers won. No, this was always locked in. The numbers never change. The structure uh, of the rookie cap is set up and you're slotted. So uh, as I stated from early on, these two were arguing over things that didn't matter uh, as far as offset language, because that's never going to come into play with the number three overall pick, uh, because the Chargers certainly aren't going to cut them 
uh, before year four. And and from him, uh, the, the he, he was offered early, far earlier in the process, he was offered more of the signing bonus up front than most top five picks. You generally get a deferred payment schedule. Some comes in the year you sign, some comes in the next year. Uh, and the Chargers were at 85% before they got this done, and and that's well above the average. So it's clear that it was agent-driven, and and I've said early on, Joey was getting some really, really bad advice, and I think the NFLPA and his agent uh, agency, which is CAA, were trying to use them. And and it was was not fair to him. Uh, It was not fair to the San Diego Chargers, obviously, but while I say that, the Chargers uh, deserve their own acrimony toward them because at first they wanted both. They wanted all set language and they wanted 50% of the money deferred. And that's just ridiculous. You usually get one or the other if you're a top five pick and and the Chargers deserve a lot of criticism also. But in this environment with this CBA, it's unheard of. This is the first time a holdout has gone this far and it will be the last time because it's not going to happen again, at least under this system. John, another decision that came down today, Trevor Simeon named the starting quarterback out in Denver. Mark Sanchez out of the starting situation. Now it looks like, according to reports, the Broncos are trying to trade him. So what happens, most likely, in your opinion, John? Does he get traded, or do the Broncos cut him by 4 p.m. tomorrow? Well, I think they're going to try to trade him, and they're probably not going to be able to, and then they're going to release him because he's if they keep him uh, and he's on the week one uh, roster because he's a vested veteran, that guarantees his entire salary for the year, $4.5 million. Plus, they would have to give a seventh-round pick to the Eagles. Uh, if they cut him, they can sign, they can save $3.5 million of those $4.5 million, and they don't have to send the draft pick. So, It's pretty clear that they're going to release him, and I think everybody in the NFL knows that. So if you do have any interest, like a team like Dallas, for instance, which which obviously needs a backup quarterback, well, you're going to be smart enough to wait because the Broncos have to release him. So I I think that's the ultimate end game, and it's it's surprising to me because I thought uh, he would be the bridge quarterback to Paxton Lynch, but... Maybe Gary Kubiak doesn't think he has anything left physically. It's a very strange decision uh, to go with a guy who's never thrown an NFL pass uh, with that kind of defense. With all those, to me, it's very difficult to look Lon Miller in the eye and uh, Chris Harris and all those great defensive backs and Derek Wolf, DeMarcus Ware, and and say we're going to go with a kid who's got a couple kneel downs, but. Hey, Gary Kubiak's got a lot of rope after winning the Super Bowl, and he's using it with this decision. Trevor Simeon, the first player from Northwestern to start a quarterback since Otto Graham. History, right, John? Yeah, Mike Castro <laughs> almost got there. Almost. He never did start, it. Never did start an NFL game. Uh, one more thing, John, before I let you go. Tony Romo is going to be out six to ten weeks. Another upper body injury. I mean, this guy just can't stay healthy. How much does this open up the NFC East than it already was? Because, listen, Zach Prescott has played nice, but he's still a rookie quarterback, and we have to treat him as such until we see otherwise. So how much of a big news is this for the Eagles, Redskins, and Giants? Oh, it's huge news. Uh, I mean, as well as Dak has played, Dak has been tremendous. We just talked about with the Eagles in preseason. Nobody's game planning for him. Uh, They now know he's a starter, and everybody – uh, is going to start preparing for Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott, and it's going to get a lot more difficult for him. Uh, the, the, the Cowboys are trying to point to the anomaly that was Russell Wilson. But if you think about that, Josh, yeah, I mean, Seattle had a great running game, and Dallas can maybe say we have the potential to have one with the great offensive line and, and Ezekiel Elliott. But the one part of that equation in Seattle they can't match is the Seahawks had the best defense in football, uh, and Dallas' defense is awful. So all you have to do is look at that team's history and their record with Tony Romo and their record without him, 
it's significant and it's stark and it's really, really bad when he's not there. So the Cowboys are going to take a huge step back. Uh, and, yeah, it opens up the division. I think that's where part of the optimism comes with the Eagles because now they're looking at this landscape and saying it's not a very good division again, and maybe the winner gets nine wins, and why can't we get nine wins? And, and I think I don't necessarily think they're wrong in, in that way of thinking. You can follow John McMullen on Twitter at JF McMullen. He's our Eagles insider for 97.3 ESPN.com, and he covers the NFL for today's pigskin. John, catch you tomorrow. Hey, thank you, Josh.